Sure, I'll go first. So, uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me. This is such a privilege. Uh, changes up what I do every day. Uh, this is what I want to do every day, is actually interact with students, right? Um, not always do the administrative stuff that a dean does, right? So, uh, so thank you for the invite. Um, anytime you need me to do this, I will be very diligent, right? So, um, great question. And it's a question that um, all of you, either, either as future healthcare providers, future physicians, uh, need to start thinking about right now, okay? So what, what was actually asked of me was my why, what's my purpose, right? Why do I do what I do? Specifically, why do I concentrate on patient safety and health policy, right? So you heard a little bit of my background. I'm a, uh, I'm a family physician by training. I've always been involved in uh, academic medicine from the day that I graduated uh, medical school to residency, I worked for a university. I only worked at two universities, one in New Jersey and here in Texas for uh, UNTHSC. But I practiced medicine during that period of time as a family doc. And over those 30 years, I got to see um, how ineffective the healthcare system is. The current healthcare system in this country is broken. Does it work? I'll be the first one to tell you that. Okay. And that's what everyone here needs to understand. Right? Because we need to fix it. My, my generation uh, hasn't been able to fix it. We try. Um, and as an academician, as a dean, I have to think about how we're going to do this. For over the past hundred years, medical education essentially has not changed in how we train medical students. We keep doing it the same way. We keep focusing on the same definition or perception of what a doctor is. And when we keep doing that and expect different outcomes, whether it's quality care, safer care, more value care, and we don't get those changes, you know, you know what we call that, right? Doing the same thing every day and expecting a different outcome, what do we call that? Sanity, and the healthcare system in this country is insane. I'll be totally transparent. So one of the areas, right, uh, I focus on is, you heard it, my school, my medical school's purpose, our why, my why is to change the way healthcare is being delivered. My why isn't just training medical students, producing more residents, having you pass courses. That's not what it's all about. The ultimate goal here, our why, is changing healthcare and how it's delivered. And there's many things that are affecting healthcare right now that have been affecting healthcare, whether it's access to care, whether it's the value of care. We as a country spend more money in healthcare than any country in the world, and yet we have the outcomes no better than a third world country. There's something wrong. And it's up to us to fix it. I love the slide. Right? We have too many physicians in this country who know this, who go to work every day frustrated with the inabilities to provide the care that they were taught how to do during medical school. That they get up every day wanting to be able to deliver and they run into barriers. They run into other people telling them how this should be done. You run into people who want to interfere with our patient-physician uh, relationship. And we let that happen. My generations let that happen. But yours doesn't. Patient safety, major problem. What's the major cause of death in this country? What's the leading cause of death in this country right now? Anybody want to tell me? Mismatched diseases? No. Heart disease. Heart disease. Second cause of leading cause of death in this country is? Cancer. Cancer. Third leading cause of death in this country is? What? Medical errors. 
but you will never see that written anywhere because that's not what we put on a death certificate. COVID got in the way, came in about the third leading cause of death over the past couple of years, but thank God that's getting better. But if you actually look at the causes of death in this country related to medical errors, you're looking at anywhere between 200 to 400,000 deaths a year. Preventable deaths. You know what that's the equivalent to? Think about those numbers. I'll give you a good, I'll give you a good analogy. If every day, this, every day you went home from your classes, you turned on the TV, and you saw the news come on, and the news said, Two jumbo jetliners crashed today. And tomorrow you go home and the same news report comes on. Two different jumbo jetliners. And the next day you hear it again. And you hear that 365 days a year, year after year. That is health care and that's patient safety and that's related to medical error in this country. And yet we allow it to happen every day. If two jumbo jetliners crashed in this country for two days in a row, you could rest assured that the airline industry would be closed within two days. Every airline, every plane would be grounded. And yet all of us and all of our communities go to doctors and hospitals every day in that system. How do we let it happen? We know what the numbers are. It hasn't changed. It hasn't changed over the past 20 years. Big care hasn't gotten any safer. So I as a dean looked at that. We have to do a better job at preparing physicians, nurses, administrators, understanding what patient safety is. And I can tell you, most physicians, and I have no problem saying this, know absolutely nothing about safety science, absolutely know nothing about how to make care safer. They think they do, but they don't. And that's why we can't get out of our own way, because we fail to admit the fact that we don't know what they're doing. So, TCOM, changing the way healthcare is delivered. One of the ways we're doing it, every one of our graduates, not only learns about patient safety, many medical schools may teach a couple lectures on patient safety. TCOM not only teaches a major course in patient safety that is supported by the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, but require every one of our students to get an international certification in patient safety. I have one, 25 of my faculty have one, now over 650 graduates of TCOM have one. We make up about 15% of the world's patient safety experts come from TCOM. Every one of them know more than most hospital administrators related to patient safety. Will that make care safer tomorrow? Probably not. But we start somewhere. We start somewhere, we start planting seeds. We plant one tree at a time. Hopefully they will teach students that come after them about patient safety. They will develop leadership programs. They will become leaders of hospitals. They will run their own practices. They will know how to make care safer for their patients and for our community. I go around the country and tell this story to other medical school deans to try to get them to do what TCOM did. We're the only medical school in the world that does this. How can that possibly be? How come I have to spend so much time convincing medical school deans to invest money to do this? It's not cheap to do it. I invest money to do it. You have no problems investing money in teaching, other, <coughs> teaching students about cardiovascular disease. You have no problem teaching students about cancer. Third leading cause of death, we got problems teaching students about this. We have to convince people to do this. That's why I get up every morning. That's why I'm passionate about patient safety. I was six years old, had my tonsils out. I was sent home. When we used to take tonsils out many, many years ago, when we were young. 
top, taking your tonsils out was kind of a routine thing, wasn't it? When you, you knew you were going to get them out. That's how healthcare has changed. We found out that that was an unnecessary operation. But when I was six, that was just routine. Had my tonsils taken out. You get sent home the next day. I got discharged. I was sitting, I remember, in my parents' bedroom, recovering from my tonsillectomy. I was watching TV there all by myself. My parents were on the first floor. I was in the second floor uh, in bedroom. Started choking. Couldn't breathe. Guess what happened? The surgeon left the scars in the back of my throat that came dislodged. I aspirated it. It was turning blue. Thank God my mom was walking up the steps to check on me. Saw me choking. Help me out, I would have died. Six-year-old kid would have died from a tonsillectomy. That's patient safety. That's a near miss. That's a near miss. You know how many near misses there are a day? Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of near misses that never get reported. I'll stop there. I'll leave. Thanks, that's pretty sobering. <laughs> I appreciate it. Now, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself first. I did grow up in Duckerville, just down the street. And if you ever been there, it's a pretty little town, and it's uh, pretty much what it was like in the 70s, you know. Uh, as far as being the only minority, there was probably 800 students, and about 20 of us were not Anglo, and that was different. Um, and growing up, I always seemed to get hurt. I don't know why. Uh, I guess I was a daredevil. When I was nine years old, I broke my leg. And I had to crawl across the ice when uh, my little niece was learning how to skate over there. I was like, I, I should have been in that class, you know. <laughs> but uh, I saw the doctors downtown, Dallas, and uh, they did a great job, job on my leg. And I thought, well, oh, that might be a great thing to do. But I was more interested in law at the time. So I thought for a long time I'd be a lawyer. I wrote my hand, wrote my arm when I was 12 years old riding a bicycle. And I go, dang, these guys are nice. Maybe I should do this. And I still kind of put it in the back of my mind. And then uh, when I was 14, my grandmother, who, you know, uh, used to write her letters and draw her pictures when I was a little kid, and she called me Johnny, my love, that was her pet name for me. But she passed away in the middle of the night, and I said, I have no idea why she died. You know, what happened to my grandmother? Nobody in my family was from the medical field, you know. When I got help, I went to Parkland or somewhere like that, and my mother had to translate, and I'd be sitting in the corner and said, are you going to help my kid? He's been over here for a couple of hours, and... Of course, they, they helped me out. But, uh, you know, I realized I wanted to do something in my life that helped people, that made a difference. And, you know, I think being a lawyer does that, but at the same time, I wanted it to be more meaningful even, and also add something to what my family lacked. And that's why I decided to go to medical school. And to be honest with you, I know there's some bleak statistics, but I love what I do. Every day I go into work, I see patients that I've known for 15, 20, some 30 years, and I've helped them stay alive and healthy, and, and uh, you know, my passion is type 2 diabetes. I have, like, rings of cousins with diabetes. My grandfather had it when he was uh, young and lost a leg, and his kidneys went, and, you know, uh, he used to tell me crazy things about his diabetes. I said, Grandpa, just do what the doctor says, okay? But, uh, um, you know, now the advances in type 2 diabetes medicine have made it so pleasurable. When I first started practicing, and if you ever do medicine, you'll realize patients get blamed for so much. You know, patients get blamed for their diet. Patients get blamed for their exercise or lack of. And what I realized with the new medicines is that it's not their fault that they have an appetite that is twice as much as everybody else and that they gain weight faster because they're hungry again. But when you change that whole dynamic with the new medicines, all of a sudden, they're losing weight like crazy, and their sugars get under control, and their risk for heart attacks and strokes and losing limbs and going blind just goes down and down and down. And that's what I see with the promise of medicine. And every day I go to work, I actually say, you know what, I hope I have a diabetic today, a new one, because I want to tell them about these new medicines that we have now, and I want to make sure that they realize it starts with diet and exercise. You know, you can't take the medicine and just go, oh, you know, 
I'm going to be great. You got to you got to be interested in your health, and that's what I get my patients interested in. And uh, um, you know, the other part of what I do is we call it organized medicine. Organized medicine is just a bunch of doctors getting together and say, hey. This isn't working, let's make it better. And that's what I started doing back in about 2005. And uh, you know, in 2005, a, a lot of doctors were leaving the state because malpractice rates were going out the roof. People were getting large settlements. And in Texas, we started this thing called tort reform where if you got sued, you could only make $500,000 you know, if you sued the hospital and the doctor. It used to be you could get a million or two million dollars, and now, that has changed and over the last 20 years doctors are coming to Texas like crazy and want to practice here and take care of our patients and it's been a great thing and some of the other things that the book you were talking about and accountable talks about is some of the problems it is to be a, a doctor and I realize that you know owning my own practice up in Little Elm you know I own my building my wife practices with me and uh, some of the headaches I had running the business side have kind of gone away a little bit but we continue to push back, you know. Have you all heard of prior authorizations? You ever heard that stupid term? Yes. Okay, so what that means is say, one of you guys comes to see me and says, you know what, you need this medicine. And I think it's going to make you feel great. And then you have to call the insurance company and they say, well, we disagree with Dr. Forrest. And they say, you know what, if you can tell us exactly why, we might pay for it. And uh, a couple of years ago, the legislator passed the law saying if I go through that whole process and you know what, they end up paying for that medicine, 90% of the time I no longer have to call them. And so that's one of the wins we've had besides tort reform. But it's over and over. There's about 6,000 bills going through the legislature this year. I don't know if y'all know this, but Texas gets together every two years for six months to make all the laws in Texas. In about 20% of those, maybe even 25, 30% of those have to do with my job. And so I said to myself, you know what, maybe I should go down to Austin and talk to my legislators, talk to my senators, and tell them, hey guys, this is a dumb idea. This is the good idea. You know, being able to tell who got immunized and when is a great idea. And we should be able to track that. And there's a lot of pushback in the legislature because people want their privacy at the same time. When you show up at the hospital, you should be able to tell easily that you've been immunized against this, this virus or that virus. You know, so the legislature is hard to push. Now, something else we push back against is making sure that you're treated by a doctor or professional that is adequately trained. You know, when I got trained, I trained for 16,000 hours on average. Most doctors are. And some other people out there are trained for 500 hours, 800 hours. Yet they want to do my job. That's like saying uh, a lawyer who trains, you know, three or four years and then maybe does some training after that should be on the same level as some clerk that's trained for maybe six months. And how safe do you think it is when somebody that doesn't know what they don't know, that doesn't know that if you put them on a medicine for diabetes, you better call them in a couple weeks and make sure they're doing okay. When I put somebody on a dangerous medicine, I hand them my business card with my cell phone on it. And I say, if you have any problems, give me a call. Because I don't have all the knowledge of this doctor over here. But I know what's important for the medicines that I give my patients. And you're accountable for that patient. I train uh, medical students. I train residents in my office. And I let them know that we are given an awesome responsibility to take care of patients like you and patients in the community. And if you don't realize it, you've got to trust them to call you and you've got to you got to give them some trust. You know, they're not going to trust you if you don't trust them. And so I give them my card because they will call me. You know how many calls I've gotten after I give my cell phone out? Probably about one. You know, because I know I'm there. And that's, that's how I, I run my practice. You know, uh, like I said, I, I love what I'm doing. I'm happy every day I show up in the office. I'm not happy when I get no shows because it's a waste of time and it's kind of boring. You know, I, I like to uh, stay busy and really I spend about two or three minutes saying, catching up about what they've been doing. One of my patients, I don't know, any of y'all golf at all? Play golf? He does, okay. Well, they had this major tournament, and one of my patients works on these golf courses, so he took me out to look at a golf course, and, you know, his, his diabetes went from totally uncontrolled to perfect in three months. Now, I'm talking about perfect numbers. 
Uh, and that's what the new healthcare system we can do for you. Now, there are some problems. There are things that are dropped through the cracks, but from the care that was available 100 years ago till now, we're living so much longer. You know, we have access to care now. There's problems, but, um, you know, granted, there's things that we can do, but I, I'm, I'm very optimistic. I love being a doctor, and I tell anybody that comes to my office, hey, if you want to make a difference in your life, become a physician, become an internal medicine or primary care doctor, where you see people every every day, every day of your life, if you want to, not that many, not that often, but I make sure that I tell them, look, you're not going to live to be 100, but if you live to be 80, I hope that you live a happy life and that you're doing everything you want to do. You see your grandkids, you go, you're able to go to their school and participate in their life because too many people are having strokes and heart attacks and feel like crap and can't get to where they want they want to go and do the things they want to do. And I, I push back against that by just giving them good advice. You know, quit eating the crap that's out there. You know, the sugar industry is worse than the tobacco industry. I think people know about tobacco, but they don't know about sugar. And one of the people, one of my patients actually works for a company that I tell them not to eat, uh, Frito-Lay. Any of y'all eat Frito-Lay products? Cookies and crackers and chips. All that crap. If you, if the one thing you take away from this, if you don't become a physician, just realize if you do away with all that crap and sugary drinks, it is bad for you. It is killing us. And uh, that could solve 80% of the problems if we just changed our diet and exercised and stayed healthy. Uh, anyway, that's where I'm at, and thank you very much. the sleuths of medicine. I'm going to ask you one question. When I, when I come in there, I'll, I'll say, I'll say, okay, I'll not start asking questions. I say, hey, why are you here? And all of a sudden, patients will just start talking. And if you don't interrupt them, in the next two minutes, they'll tell you, they'll tell you all the things you need to know about their life and what's wrong with them. And really, you just got to show up and be there. You know, um, it's really simple. If you're a well-trained doctor, patient will tell you all you need to know, with it, and they'll give you the good history. Now, of course, if you can't, they can't talk for themselves, like pediatric, that's a different story, but my job is just to listen, and, and then ask pointed questions. I don't know if y'all have taken the history before, but the most important thing is don't interrupt. Let them tell you their story, and they will, and uh, I've been amazed the last 30 years. Patients will tell me exactly what I need to know. You know, it was funny, when I was uh, training in uh, Chattanooga, I was doing a general surgery before I did internal medicine, and uh, my little brother was about y'all's age. And my sister, I, they were in Dallas, I was in Chattanooga, and she called me up and said, John, your little brother's having problems. And I go, well, tell me what's going on. Well, he just started having pain down on his side, and he's not eating any food, and he, and he feels nauseous, and he's just laying there on the couch, not moving. And I go, okay, he's got appendicitis. You know, I knew in two minutes what he had, you know, 10 seconds. And sure enough, he had his appendix taken out. But all you had to do was listen to my sister tell the story. And as far as being a good patient, you just have to show up. Now, later on, you have to take your medicine. You have to listen to what we tell you and take notes. Uh, you know, I don't mind people recording my visit. A lot of times we'll give them handouts to tell you exactly what, you, what they need to do. But being a good patient for me is just being able to show up and uh, follow instructions. Yeah, so um, look where we're at from 20 years ago, right? So the answer to that question is I would tell patients to become informed, right? We have at our fingertips every piece of information that, um, that there is. We can look it up on our phone. Like 20, 30 years ago, we didn't have that. But I often find patients 
um, not doing is uh, their willingness to challenge their provider, their willingness to ask more questions of the provider. Many um, physicians will often think that that's just more respect. We want, and patients want to provide respect for the physician. You know, historically, it's always been a kind of that respected figure. You don't challenge a physician. They know what they're doing. But again, you're a healthcare consumer. You are consuming healthcare. You have a right to access good quality care. And she should ask for that. Patients do look up reviews more often on Amazon than they do for their own health care. They buy products on Amazon based on reviews, but they don't do the same thing for their own health care. I want to pick on one of the students. What hospital would you go to if you were sick today? UT Southwest. Okay, which one? Parkland? No. The one that is... I don't know exactly where, but it's like near downtown. Okay. Is it Parkland? Parkland? No, it's Utah. Okay. Who would go to Parkland? Okay. Okay. How safe is Parkland right now? I haven't been there recently, but I went there because I accidentally stepped on the rusty nail and couldn't okay. get shot anywhere, and it was pretty okay. Okay. So I want you to do is just go online, look up LeapFrog patient safety. It will tell you the patient safety ratings of every hospital in this country. Parkland's rated, I believe, F. Don't quote me on it. I might be wrong, but it's not A, B, or C. I can guarantee you that. In Fort Worth, where my medical school is, we have probably four hospitals, one on each corner. We have one that has an A rating. The rest are C or D. No one knows that. Wouldn't you want to know that before you make a decision as to what hospital you're going to? Wouldn't you want to know that doctor here is a good doctor? What his outcomes are? Before you choose him to treat your diabetes? You certainly would. So I would encourage um, healthcare consumers to be more proactive in seeking out quality care. Now I'll tell you this. Most people in this country don't have good access to care, so they don't have often have choices. So although, yes, we have made great advances in medicine over the past hundred years, if I go in one zip code, the life expectancy is 83 years old. If I go four blocks down the road in a different zip code, that life expectancy goes down to 60. Same medicines, same health care system. Why do we have that health disparity? That's the issue we have to solve. Right? The technology is there. Why come we can't all access it? And the reason why is because what we do as a physician, what we're trained to do as medical doctors, when I was trained, and this is what I try to do differently as deans. Traditional medical school and what we teach you to do in residency can only impact 10 to 20 percent of someone's health. Only 10 to 20 percent. What we fail to do is, as, as a healthcare and as physicians, is what do we do with that other 80 percent that impacts someone's health? Yes, we can tell you what food to eat, what diet to eat. But if you don't have access to food, what good is that? We can tell you to go exercise. But if you can't take a walk in your neighborhood because it's unsafe, where are you going to exercise? That's what we as a healthcare, as a healthcare system have to be able to better address. We call that whole health. And that's why we do need team members. We do need PAs, nurse practitioners, social workers, pharmacists, right? Not to do exactly what we do as physicians, but to work alongside us and solve those other social determinants of health that we as physicians often ignore. Okay? 
So again, if you're a healthcare consumer, you have a choice to some degree. Ask questions. If a physician doesn't want to ask your questions, find another one. Pick a doctor like this who answers calls, picks up the phone. and advocates for you. There are many out there, and yet there are many that don't do that every day, unfortunately. So that's what you can do for yourselves, right? In seeking quality health care. You can find it. Again, you just have to be able to ask the right questions and develop that trusting relationship with that provider. If it doesn't feel right, don't say, I'm just going to go along with it. That's not right. You wouldn't do that. You would, you would you take your car to a mechanic that didn't know how to fix your car? Or didn't want to spend the time? No. It's unfortunate that we succumb to people to systems that don't actually deliver that. And we have these health disparities within that same geographical area. That's what we got to sign Okay. So the next question has to do with trust and exchanging ideas and the hospital system. So Marty talks a lot in his book about how they surveyed hospitals and found that if the providers trusted each other, if the staff trusted each other, the outcomes were so much better. In your own words, how would you describe signs of a good healthcare system? Well, it's kind of like a family. You know, if you're, you see this tenseness in a family situation, you know there's some kind of overarching person possibly that's dictating things instead of listening to the rest of the family and you know the, the whole dynamic of teamwork is definitely taking place in the hospital and uh, you know at this point I don't work in the hospital anymore you know I stopped about 15 years ago now but uh, I had aunts that were nurses and they made sure that I paid attention to the nurses so when I was at Parkland I always pay attention to the nurse and I let them know that, you know, I don't know everything. I think that's probably the number one thing is you got to realize you're going to learn a lot of things in the next probably 30, 40 years. And that's why I became a doctor too. I love to learn. But you're never going to know it all. You didn't know what your boundaries are. You didn't know where your knowledge ends. And you didn't know you can rely on your colleagues, be they other physicians, uh, the other allied uh, healthcare professionals. Uh, and also you have to trust your administrator. Right now there's a lot of distrust between administrations and uh, physicians. And a lot has to do with political issues. Uh, a lot had to do with COVID. You know, we're, they were turning against each other a little bit during COVID. And uh, we, I thought that was just unfortunate that a physician you couldn't, without uh, harming his career, talk out about what was going on with COVID. And that's what was happening in uh, the United States and the hospitals around this area too. Um, but a good system, there's give and take between administration and nursing and physicians. And, um, you know, that may not be from the textbook, but that's what I've seen, at least when I've observed good hospital systems. I, I love this question. Did you think of this question? Came yeah, I, it's I, a great I, question. Give me all the answers. Because it really, this is really what sums it all up. Is organizational culture, right? So I actually wrote some things down, right? I want you to listen to this. This is what makes a good healthcare system, whether it's a small office or a big health system, okay? So we call it a just culture, right? So if we can establish a just culture, what's the characteristics of a just culture? A just culture and a good organization, organization will recognize that humans make mistakes. And we will make errors, and there's nothing wrong with that. Okay? The second one is it encourages humans to self-report their errors. And then particularly in medicine, near misses. Wow, I almost hurt that patient. I have 
I have two options. I almost hurt, I almost hurt that patient. I could keep my mouth shut or I can report myself. And the just culture will say, humans make mistakes. Let's figure out how we can create a system where that doesn't happen again, where that near miss turns into a actually bad outcome. Okay? I sit on a hospital board, and every month I ask, how many near misses were reported in this hospital this month? Near misses, mistakes. And I'll ask you, do I want to see that number go up, or do I want to see that number go down? Who says go down? I'm a board member. I want this hospital to function really well. Do I want to see that number go down every month or go up? Who says go up? Who says go down? And most of you really don't care because you didn't put your hand up. You've got to make a call. Who says go up? And who says go down? The go ups win. A just culture wants to see more and more reporting every month. Why? Humans make errors. We will never prevent human error. So a good organization will want to see their near miss reporting consistently go up. And obviously then we deal with that. We try to fix it. We try to create systems. The third thing is people aren't punished for their mistakes. People aren't punished for making a human error. People are punished for being negligent. Two different things. Anybody hear about the case in Vanderbilt University last spring? A nurse, Redonda Vaught, gave a patient the wrong medicine. The patient unfortunately died, tragic. Vanderbilt kind of tried to cover it up. Redonda Vaughn stood up and said, I made a mistake. I'm sorry I made a mistake. Why did she make a mistake? Hospital was short staffed. She was asked to do something she doesn't normally do because she was covering someone else. She was constantly getting interrupted. She had too many patients to take care of. She gave the wrong medication. She got a medication out of a computerized dispensing machine where you have to type in the name. She typed in the, she typed in the drug, the medicine wouldn't come up. So the machine allowed her to override the name of the drug, dispense the wrong drug, the patient died. She admitted it. Guess what? The local community did. They charged her with two felonies for killing the patient. They convicted her of two felonies. She lost her license as a nurse. Sent the whole healthcare world in an uproar that knew anything about just culture, that knew anything about patient safety. She didn't have to self-report. If she didn't say anything, it might have just slipped under the rug. It was a whistleblower that called CMS, the government, came in, investigated, and found out there was a mis there was a mistake done. Mistakes happen. Two felonies. She was convicted of two felonies. That's absurd. Do you think any nurse in that hospital or any nurse in this country will self-report themselves again? Absolutely not. They just set back patient safety in this country. Thank God a different judge sentenced her. A different judge didn't sentence her to jail. Thank God she's not in jail, but she can't practice nursing anymore. That's the nurse that I want in my hospital. It was the system that caused her to make those mistakes. Overworked, too many patients. Fix that. She wasn't negligent. Okay? The fourth thing is leaders share data. They don't cover it up.
One of the reasons most of these hospitals don't do well in the leapfrog patient safety report that I just told you to ask, I told you to look up, one of the reasons why they don't rank high is because they refuse to send leapfrog the information. Why do they refuse to send information? You can make assumptions, I don't know. They could be a great hospital. They could be a sick, but they don't put the information in. That just means you don't have a culture of safety or willing to actually report your leaders. That's a concern to me. Leaders do walk rounds. Leaders walk around in the hospital and talk to the people that do the work. They ask them, what can I do for you? Anybody watch the uh, show New Amsterdam? Anybody watch that show? Come here. You guys got a lot. You're going to be doctors. You got to right? Perfect example of the head of the hospital walks around and says to the nurses, the people who clean the hospital, what can I do for you? How can we make this place better? There's a concept called high reliability organizations. You would expect healthcare would be a high reliability organization. You would want it to be highly reliable, correct? Healthcare is not anywhere close to a high reliability organization. A high reliability organization is defined as an organization that you've heard of the term Six Sigma? Anybody hear that term? Six Sigma? Like the Six Sigma bill? Is that like what? It's a, a badge kind of a It's a badge, but again, so when we talk about Six Sigma, we talk, we talk a lot about this in patient safety. In order to reach Six Sigma, you have 3.4 errors per million times you do something. That's Six Sigma. Very few industries are at Six Sigma. The nuclear power industry is Six Sigma. The U.S. Navy is Six Sigma. Guess where healthcare is? Three Sigma. What does that mean? 64,000 errors per 1 million times you do something. That's healthcare. Got to do better. So high reliability organization characteristics, they are preoccupied with failures. They don't talk about what they do right. They're constantly thinking about what's going to go wrong. They predict what's going to go wrong so they can prevent it. Second thing, they're reluctant to simplify things or simplify explanations. I sit on a board, when things happen, I get a simplified explanation. It happened because of this. Never accept a simple explanation. Do a root cause analysis, deep dive into the system that caused the problem. We rarely ever do this. High reliability organizations will do this. Sensitivity to operations. Hospital leadership will understand what's going on in his shop or his, her shop in her hospital. Understands what's needed. Understands what his people are doing. And trust his people to do it and tell him or her what needs to be done. Fourth thing is commitment to resilience. Resilience. You're going to mess up. You're going to have bad days, but what do you do with that? You get back up, you figure out what went wrong, and you do it better the next time. The fifth thing is deference to expertise. No hospital leadership is an expert. A good leader is not the expert. A good physician is not the expert. I will tell you that. A good leader and a good physician surrounds themselves with experts. And you trust your experts to do the jobs that they were trained to do. So we trust our nurses on the floor. We take care of patients every day. And we listen to them and they let, we let them tell us what needs to be done. 
not the other way around. Okay, so this is less pertinent for the students in the room today because they've got a while if they decide to go down to med school. But for the residents and for the med students who are gonna, you know, hopefully hear this recording, I really want to know when looking for a residency. You know, all you have to do is go on Reddit or Twitter, and you can find horror stories that I know that these are like the underbelly of the world, but, you know, the stories are happening, the people, the students are experiencing these terrible situations. So, tell me, are there any ways that students, medical students, can look at residency programs and kind of know, you know, is this a good program, is this a safe program? This is a program that's not going to compromise me as a young physician. You know, um, residency programs are so tough because it is true. You know, you don't know what you're going to get until you really get into the program itself. But you can talk to other physicians that are in that program. You know, when you sign up, I, know, I think now it's more automated. I know a lot of y'all are going to just get online and uh, sometimes just do online interviews. But I think it's important to visit those residency programs where they're at and see what the living conditions are. Talk to those residents in that program. And then I'm sure there are Google reviews. Uh, you were talking about Google reviews earlier, and I was like, people are Googling me all the time and uh, looking at my reviews. And so it, it is a good thing that does happen. I've got many patients who tell me, oh, yeah, I saw your reviews, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, well, great. Let's talk about you now. And uh, residency programs, I don't know if they have that, but they're probably some kind of review process. Uh, but I think you have to ask a lot of pointed questions. Okay, what are my hours going to be like? And I know your hours now are so much different than when we trained. You know, pretty much they worked us until we were half dead. And uh, when I was doing general surgery before I switched to medicine, we did 24 on, 24 off. And so that was pretty much 35 on and how many more hours were left to, to sleep a little bit and go back the next day and do it again. But uh, now there are parameters nationally that they have to follow. And you want to make sure they follow those parameters. Uh, you also want to see how many graduate from their programs, how many get board certified, how many go into fellowships that they want to go into. Uh, all these things are important for you to meet your goals. You know, if you want to become an internist like me and, and go out, you want to see how many are becoming uh, internal medicine doctors and having their own practice or joining a group that they want to join. Uh, those are things you need to think about because uh, you sure they're going to start paying you a little bit, but they're going to work you, and you're going to learn a lot. And, and you you also want to get in a program where you're going to see a lot of different things. Uh, you know, if you go to Parkland, or if you go to Methodist, or you go to JPS, you know these big county hospitals, you're going to learn a lot. You're going to have so much knowledge. You're going to know what you don't know. You're going to know who to rely on, what kind of doctors to turn to, and that's very important too. Uh, so that's my two cents on that. So, um, we started the conversation tonight, right, by uh, me telling you what my why is and what my purpose is, okay? First thing I would do and what I tell my students to do who seek out residency programs, all those things are important. What am I going to learn? Your biggest learner is going to be the patients you see, so you'll be able to see patients wherever you're at. They're going to be your best teachers. Most of the information that you'll learn, you can read out of a book. Right? Find out, ask this question of any residency program director. What is their why? What's their purpose? And if they start talking to you about what they do or how they do it, they don't have one. What do they want to do? What do they eventually want their graduates to be able to do? Does it match your why? Right? What is your brand going to do? Because essentially the question is, what's the brand of a residency program? Is it good or bad? Right? Any good marketing person who understands anything about brand We'll start with what 
that particular organization or even a residency, what's their why? What's their purpose? Why do they exist? And if they say, well, we exist to train residents. No, stop. That's what you do every day. What ultimately do you want? And that will set their strategy. What is their strategy? Ask, what do you want your strategy with this residency program? Does it match what you want to do? If you're interested in solving the, the, the issues of a poor community that don't have access to health care, if that's what you're passionate about, find a program that's just as passionate about it, like you. That's a why. Right? So every one of you who are interested in going to health care, when you leave here today, start thinking about what is your purpose? What will make you happy? And then find the place that is aligned to your purpose and why, to your set of values, to the culture that you want to work in. And yes, you don't go and buy a car without looking. Well, maybe you do now, right? You can buy a car online. It comes out of the machine now, right? It's kind of odd. But again, I'll go back to it. This is where you want to work. This will be your first job out of medical school. Right? You have a choice of who your employer is. And being in a residency for three to five years, and being in a place where it doesn't match what you want to do can be a miserable place. Find the people you connect with. Find the people that think like you. You will get up every day, come into work, like he said, he comes to work happy every day. Because your missions and your visions are aligned. Right? But pay attention to the culture. Right? Only 20% of residents in this country actually do their residency at a place that they actually visit it. Not for interviews, it actually visited and went and tried to do a rotation there. Kind of nuts. Right? It's such an important decision. So again, think about, it's all about culture. Right? Culture eats strategy for lunch. Right? My daughter graduated from TCOM went to Stanford for an interview. She was invited for an interview to Stanford University, right? Great place. You hear all the great things about Stanford University. She came out of there, she says, Daddy, that was one of the worst interviews I've ever had. Not the way they treated me, the questions that they asked, I would never want to work there. That's culture. That's what you go and look for. Not reputation, not just the name, but can you fit there and will you be comfortable there, right? There are patients everywhere that treat, patients will be your teachers. Okay, last one. So let's talk about activism. That was one of the main things we did want to actually get to. And so let's have a conversation. What are some of the ways that students, undergrads, med students, physicians can really get involved and help change the culture? I know TCOM is doing great work with their patient safety certification, but what else is there for the students who don't go to TCOM for other members of the medical community? Well, you know, my organization, the Texas Medical Association, um, we do so much to make sure that the health of Texans is improved. And we do that by really policy. You know, policy is so important. You know, saying we can do this, we can do that. And who makes policy in Texas? The legislature. So we have uh, a lot of our resources uh, geared toward advocacy. And advocacy is a word that I, I struggle with, even though I'm a political science major. I have no idea what the hell they're talking about. But, Basically, it means going down to Austin and speaking for your profession and your patients. You're advocating for them. And uh, I love doing that. You know, I love talking to the legislatures. And, and, you know, most of them are lawyers, teachers. There used to be an exterminator that was really powerful. 
And he's making laws to determine our health, the health of our Texas and the health of our, our medical practices. Uh, now, as far as getting involved, the way I got involved was the thing we do called First Tuesdays. So the first Tuesday of every month of the session, me and about four or five hundred of my colleagues take our white coats, which I don't wear anymore, to be honest with you. But we wear it and we go to Austin. We have medical students with us, uh, residents, and we talk about things like residency slots. You know, we used to not have enough residency slots in Texas, so how are we getting the doctors trained? So we made sure that the medical students were there saying, you know what, I want to be uh, internal medicine, and there's only like 10 spots, so we need to fund more, and it costs a lot of money, millions of dollars to fund those residency programs, and so we make sure the legislators understand, okay, we got these kids through medical school, we probably spent $200,000, $300,000 of public money on those students, and we're going to let them go to Florida or California or wherever instead of keeping them here, because we know that Residents that finish the residencies here tend to stay here, and uh, we want them here. And that's you know one of the big areas where y'all advocate because we let y'all tell your stories about why you want to be a doctor, why you know your why, why it's important for them to have to pay for those slots. And we've been very successful. Right now, there's 1.1 average residency slots in Texas per medical student, and we've got to keep working because there've been. Another 800 students have been added in the last five years. We've doubled the number of medical students, uh, medical student spots. And um, another area, area where you could get involved, um, really in, in the local level, I don't do as much, to be honest with you. I'm more at the state level. But at the national level, there's a lot going on with medical students. Uh, I talked to the AMA. They have uh, a lot of resources on their website for how to get in medical school, how to get involved. And all you have to do is Google the American Medical Association and look for undergraduate uh, resources, and it's all right there. Uh, the Texas College of, uh, or the Texas chapter of the American College of Physicians is my internal medicine group, and we do a lot, but not as much. But uh, I'll give you all some of my cards when I leave, and there's things you can do there. Um, also, there's um, ways you can expose yourself to medicine more and learn more about medicine. Uh, through the ACP, which is uh, doing preceptorships during your summer uh, once you get to medical school. Um, basically, I have uh, students that spend a month with me uh, during their first and second years of medical school, and they just follow me around, and I let them do physicals and take histories and do procedures. If they're, if they're simple and they're not going to hurt anybody, of course, got to keep them safe. But, uh, you know, that's something that you'll be able to do. Uh, also, just uh, talk to your local hospitals and see if there's some kind of way you can volunteer and learn about the systems uh, because there, there is a, a lot of ways you can expose yourself to, to medicine and patients and uh, that's just some starters and there's plenty more. Yeah, I can't agree any, I mean, this is the, you nailed it right, it's organized medicine, okay? So um, let's stop complaining about it and actually becoming change agents, right? All of us can be change agents if one, we know how to change the system, we're willing to change the system, we're willing to put in the hours to change the system, right? So um, TNA, ANA, AOA, again, osteopathic, um, allopathic, uh, have similar parallel organizations. But TNA is terrific. Every one of my students gets free membership to TNA. They get free uh, a membership to the osteopathic version of that. They're invited to their monthly meetings, OK? You just got to take advantage of it. Right? We are going to be handing this profession down to your generation. It's time for those who are young to step up. And we do have people to step up, but we need, we need every student to be doing this, not two or three in each class. When and if you come into medical school, Mark my words, you will be busy learning medicine. There will be some schools, like mine, that has a large chunk of curriculum that's just focused on how are you going to change the healthcare system. I'll teach you about policy. 
That's how the sausage gets made. I hate politics. I went into medicine because I hate politics. I wanted to help people, right? We all want to do that. But I came to the quick realization that it can't be done unless you know how to work the system. And working the system is through policy. So if there's opportunities as you're going through your early education to get training in health policy, to get trained in public health. Anybody in here studying public health? I want you as my medical students. I want you as my medical students. Who's studying biology here? That's what I studied. Didn't help me a damn bit in medical school. I must be saying, they got me into medical school. I had to pass that darn organic chemistry class. <laughs> Didn't use organic chemistry once in my life. I don't use it now. Okay. <laughs> it is what it is. Right? But what do students need? You need more public health. I need students that can innovate. You guys don't have engineering here, right? No? You have liberal arts, right? Liberal arts, okay? You have a liberal arts degree. The two students I chase down the most, public health, engineers for medical school. Yes, we'll take you if you're biology and chemistry <laughs> and all those. But why do I want those two? Because I'm thinking in my head, these are students who came out of high school, have a purpose or passion to learn about public health, health systems, how to make communities healthy, how to go into a community or a zip code and understand the fact that the 80% I talked about that doctors don't know what to do with to make someone healthy? Yes, I can give a medication to control blood pressure, diabetes. But what do I do when they don't have food? What do I do when they don't have exercise? What do I do when they don't have heat in the home? What do I do when they can't have transportation that gets them to the doctor's office? That's public health. That's population health. That's whole health. That's what we have to do better. An engineer. Engineers go into an engineer because they have a different mindset. They don't study what has been done like we do in biology and the basic sciences. They study what they're going to do differently. They solve problems. They innovate. They're entrepreneurs. That's what healthcare needs. Innovators. I see a problem, how am I going to fix it? Totally different mindset. Right? So that's what so that's what we need. That's what I'm trying to recruit. Yes, I'm doing it differently than most medical schools. I want to be different than most medical schools. Not because other medical schools are not good, but going back to what I said, we've been doing it the same way and expecting different results. And I'm not here to become insane, right? So when you get into the field of medicine, when you get into a medical school, don't go to the dean and tell him, I only want to learn about anatomy, physiology, and well, because that's what's on the board test. because the licensing boards test nothing about all these things I talked about. It's shame on them. Why don't they test them? Because they're created by the same people that went through this 100-year-old system that don't know how to do it any better. So that's why we're planting seeds. That's why I'm here tonight. I told you I was so happy to be here because you have to hear this message. You are the future. You're the ones that can change it. You're the one who's going to be sitting here 30 years from now telling how you changed the system. That's why it's so important to hear this message. 
Let me add something to that. You know, Brandon, I didn't think that's a good field to go to, but I think more importantly, you guys got blindsided by COVID and all the BS you had to deal with, with remote learning and all that. And, you know, I have residents that didn't lay a hand on a patient for, for almost two years, you know? They didn't know how to look a patient in the eye again anymore. They didn't know how to explain to them what was wrong with them. You know, I think my liberal arts degree in government really helped me think outside the box. And it also helped me how to relate to people. You know, I tell people one of the most important things I do is just explain and convince people that this strategy of care is the most important thing that they can do and help themselves, help, you know, help them help themselves. So keep your interests broad, you know. Have a good time in college, you know. Learn things you want to learn. Not too good, though. Get you in trouble. Well, you yeah. know, there's good. There's a little good stuff. Always pushing. You can always push it too hard. But you know, I took. I mean, like I said, I was government. I had a Russian a minor, minor. I had uh, business, Spanish. But I took the classes that interest me because you're paying a lot of money for this education. You might as well get something out of it. You enjoy the rest of your lives, and then also they broaden your interest because your patients are going to come to you and if they. See, all you're doing is looking at the computer and not talking to them. How many have y'all been to a doctor and that's what they did to you? That's disgusting to me. You know, your patient should, my, my wife, she also practiced with me. One patient came to her and, and she said, oh, hello, how are you doing? And the patient said right away, well, you're my new doctor. And she goes, well, you just met me. Said, how do you know that? Said, you're the first person to introduce themselves to me in the last five doctors I've had. Don't be that doctor that doesn't say hello to their patient. You know, I don't look at the computer when I come in the room. I, I say hello to the patient. I say, hey, how you doing? What's been going on in your life? Be that kind of doctor. That's what we need out of you guys. We also need these kind of people, too. And trust me, a lot of things, Dr. Filippito, I'm sorry. I'm terrible with names, but right. uh, um, a lot of the things he said are resonate with me a lot, and, and I'd love to learn more about it. But for me, you know, I'm an independent physician. I have my own practice. I have different goals and I have different challenges in my life, you know, running a practice of our own and, and doing these things, and I've had to learn how to think outside the box, and to do these things he's talking about on my own to make sure that the patient is always first. You know, your patient is so important. Everything revolves around our patients, everything we do every day, and I have to make sure my staff knows that, and I really wouldn't be able to do that if I was just trained in engineering our biology or biochem. I had to learn a lot of things for myself, and I think my education really helped me do that. And so, if you want to be a French major, if you want to be a music major, and you want to be a physician, there's nothing wrong with that. Matter of fact, I think it should be encouraged. Okay, thank you. So that is the end of our questions. I know some people have to break and go home for the next thing. Um, if y'all could join me in a round of applause for Dr. Schwartz and Dr.